as we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. Thank you, praise team, for that awesome call to worship, which makes sense because we're about to do our call to worship. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Conan. I am the Creative Arts Student Ministry Director here at Victory Lutheran Church. So glad that you braved the storm, <laughs> this spring storm. It, it's spring, right? Almost? Maybe? I'm hoping. I'm praying. I, we did. We sprung forward. We all lost an hour of our lives this morning. How do we feel? I'm feeling great. Um, not really. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Enough, uh, enough goofiness. Let's go ahead and get into our call to worship today, which comes from Psalm 95 verses 1 through 7, which reads, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we, we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. Let's continue now in worship. Mike? So please stand if you're able and sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Our scripture this morning comes from Romans 2, verses 1 through 4. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Well, as we continue our our worship, let's just uh, take a few moments to think about our week, to think about things maybe we struggled in, think about where you've fallen short, And think about how Christ has really pulled you up and covered you with his blood. So let's just take a little bit of quiet time right now. And uh, and let's just think about this week and and ask God for, uh, for forgiveness for all those things where we failed and fallen short. Let's pray. Merciful Father, as we contemplate our week and we think about the weeks ahead, we just know that in our lives we're going to fall short because we are just mere humans. As Scripture talks about, um, we're not perfect. When God passes judgment, when you pass judgment on us, it's based on truth. But we're just mere men. Your kindness, Lord, just leads us into repentance today. Just thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for that blood that covers our sins, that washes us clean, not because of anything we did, but because of what you've done on the cross for your son, Jesus. Thank you so much for that grace, for that forgiveness, and the fact that we can walk in freedom because of what you've done. In your name we pray. All right, let's continue to worship together. If you're able, please stand as we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
Jesus name that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Wider than snow we may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will part in and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous infinite Thank you, worship team. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, guys. Um, I forgot something really important at the beginning of the service, and that is our morning announcements. Uh, would you turn to the screen for this morning's announcements? Thank you. 
Good morning, church, and welcome to Victory. Kelsey here with your morning announcements. First up, if you haven't already, please submit your family photo to Faye so it can be added to the church directory. If you would like to have your photo taken, please reach out to Conan and he would be happy to help take a picture for you guys. And also, please be praying for the group of people who are on the Israel trip as they traverse the Holy Land. Just pray that it would be just a great experience for them, for safe travels, um, the Lord would just cover them. And can you guys believe it? It is almost Easter. Mark your calendar for Thursday, April 6th at 7 p.m. It's our Monday Thursday service. Then on the 7th of April, it's Good Friday. So mark your calendar for 7 p.m. for that service. And then Easter Sunday is April 9th. We will have two services, one at 8.15 and one at 10.45, both of our living cross. It is going to be an amazing day. You're not gonna wanna miss it, so mark your calendar. Don't forget, you can also give online at findvictory.org or you can give on our church app. If you need any help downloading it and getting it set up, please reach out to Conan and Faith. They would both be more than happy to help you get it set up. It has been super great, super fun to use. You guys, thanks for coming, and I hope you have a blessed Sunday. See you next week. Well, those are our morning announcements. Um, so as you might have just heard, Pastor Sean, Faye, and a bunch of other people are away to Israel where they're suffering in 80-degree weather and uh, getting to traverse the Holy Land. But keep praying for them because I'm sure you know they're dealing with jet lag and all that stuff too. But um, we're really excited to see the pictures and hear the stories when they come back. But if you think of it throughout the week, just say a little prayer for them just for safety because, you know, being in that neck of the woods, it can be, it, it just depends on the day, really. Um, but with that, I'm going to set up our, oh, wait, there's one other thing. Before I get into the offering, um, you might have noticed there's a table out there in the narthex with the, a bunch of movie tickets. And uh, those movie tickets aren't just sitting there for decoration or anything. They're there because we have some generous donors in our church that wanted to put those tickets in your hands to go see this powerful movie called The Jesus Revolution. I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to see it. I saw three quarters of it before I had to leave last Saturday after getting sick. Um, but I'm better now, thank God. Um, but I plan on going to see the rest of that movie because it was amazing, the three quarters of it that I did see. It was awesome. Chase saw it three times. You can probably write a book about it. Um, but no, seriously, if you haven't seen this movie, do yourself a favor. Grab a couple tickets for you and your family and maybe get like five extra ones that you can invite somebody with. This is a great opportunity for you to invite friends, maybe some family that maybe don't have a great relationship with Jesus. Or maybe this is just an awesome opportunity for you to just fellowship with somebody and bless somebody. Either way, I don't know what, what it is, how you're going to use those tickets, but I encourage you, take some of those tickets and bring some friends with you. The movie's going to be in theaters, I believe, until the 15th, so you got a couple days. Um, Corey, the owner over at the movie theater, is talking about maybe extending it for another week, um, but don't bank on that. So grab some tickets. Uh, I think there's movie showings happening this afternoon. If you guys are looking for something to do after being snowed in for a couple days, uh, this would be an awesome opportunity to do it. Um, so go ahead, make sure you grab a couple tickets on your way out today. And then with that, let's go ahead and pray for this morning's offering. Um, if you're a guest here visiting us, we don't, we don't want anything from you. We don't want you to feel like you have to put anything in that offering basket. Um, this is a time for those of us that call Victory home um, to just... To give as the Lord has given unto us. And without, without your support, um, ministry, it could probably happen. Because God, he's a big God. He can make things happen. But this is an opportunity for us to just give faithfully. How God has faithfully given to us. So let's pray for this morning's offering. Father God, we just thank you for the blessings that you've given us the roofs over our heads, the food on our table, the community, the fellowship that you've given us here, God. We're just so thankful for the work that you do and you continue to do here. God, we pray that you would bless this morning's offering, God, how you see fit. God, use these funds how you see fit. We commit this time to you. We commit these funds to you and the work that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, at this time, we're going to uh, move into a time of meet and greet. So uh, as Pastor Sean would say, like, if you're not feeling good, maybe just a wave. If you're, uh, you know, a little bit more outgoing and you want to, like, fist bump or shake hands, feel free to do that. Do what you're comfortable with. But take a moment, go around and greet somebody you didn't come here with today. And then during this time as well, if you want or feel led, the offering baskets in the narthex, be sure to utilize that if you need to. God bless. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Conan. Good morning. Good morning. Well, like I said at first service, you either own a four-wheel drive or snowmobiles. <laughs> or sled. Or sled. That's true. Yes, that's right. Which would have been a lot more fun with somebody else pulling me. Thanks, Mike, for coming and getting me today. I'm going to put this microphone over here. Hopefully we don't lose it. And to those among our fellowship who are over in Israel, uh, not that I think they'll take time out of their tour to uh, listen to this, but shalom. If you have your Bible, I want you to open to John chapter 18. We're going to continue in Pastor's series on witnesses to Christ. And he, uh, he gave me Peter for today. And so we, we'll be looking at passage concerning Peter. So John chapter 18 is where you want to be in your Bible this morning. During her time... Oh, King's Kids. Well, wait a minute. Somebody else is supposed to do that. <laughs> Who is in charge? Who's in head? Okay, King's Kids. King's, King's Kids. For, th this is what? This is like toddler through 30. I saw about four dads jump up. <laughs> so your king's kids, you know you should be there. You know you shouldn't be there. We need an adult, right? There has to be an adult. And confirmation, 
I don't know what he told you about taking notes for confirmation. I don't even know if any confirmation people made it today. But we're going to go ahead. Okay, King's Kids. Are we set now? Okay. Anything else? Want to get a drink? No? Okay. All right. Pastor Sean's going to scold me for being irrelevant. Irreverent. Open your Bibles to John chapter 18 then, and let's, let's begin. My wife is a social worker, and in the course of uh, working uh, in the last several weeks, she had an opportunity to meet a gentleman who is a veteran of the Korean War. The veteran of the Korean War. Wonderful guy. Great stories. And one of the things that he told her that, she, that he has enjoyed, a, a blessing that he had in his life, was through the generosity of some people, he has had an opportunity to participate in one of the honor flights where they take, they take the veterans and somebody accompanies them and they go out to Washington, D.C. and they get, to, they get to visit the memorials there in our nation's capital dedicated to those who, who fought to, to defend us in the different wars. And so he was in the Korean War. He's had a chance to be on the honor flight and, and to go through all of that. To be devoted to one's family, to comrades, to our, our leader, to the point of death, it really isn't as rare as some might think. The Bible tells us no one would lay down their life for another, but acknowledges that there are some who have given their lives for others. Military personnel, law enforcement, first responders, teachers, absolute strangers, Total strangers have at various times and in various ways placed themselves in death's path for the sake of others. Now, Peter had had a lifetime worth of experiences as far as hardship as well as wonder in the three years that he had spent with Jesus. So really, should we be surprised that just a little bit before our passage today when they were in the upper room, we should see this scene, uh, John 13, verse 37, where, where Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I knew a man um, who is Native American, and he told me he knew from experience that two of his brothers in the tribe, he knew that either one of those men would have taken a bullet for him. And years later, one of them did. And so, giving your life, saying, I will give my life for you, this isn't hollow. This, this rings true. Peter saying, Peter saying, I will lay down my life for you. Okay? But the harsh reality of our human condition, our human nature, rears itself in a kind of an ugly way in our passage for today. So again, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 12, and reading in Jesus' name. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went through with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold. The servants and officials stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, 
testify as to what it is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive, gar olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless your word. God, in this time together, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. Show us yourself in your word. Show us who we are. Open the passage and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know if you're a, a, a note taker. If you're like my, my wife and I, we have notebooks, so we just keep running, we keep running going. But if, if you have a bulletin, it's on the back of your bulletin. If you're a note taker, then um, for my own sake, um, I had this broke down. The first point is we walk into this, and it's the mess. It's the mess. Here is one of Jesus' loyal disciples, one of the most passionate enthusiasts for Jesus that there was in the world, acting as if he had, been, had, had seen and heard all that he had witnessed counted for nothing. In a passage just before this, in the garden, Peter had pulled out his sword and had struck off the ear of the high priest's servant, a man by the name of Malchus. And given that Peter was a fisherman and he struck off his ear, he either was incredibly gifted as a swordsman or he was incredibly clumsy as a swordsman if he was aiming for the neck. I haven't been able to decide which it was. But he struck off the man's ear. Luke, the physician, goes on to tell us that Jesus restored the ear, put it back on. So that was the scene that was the scene just before they had arrested him. But now here is this devoted believer acting like an unbeliever. Here is Peter, now indistinguishable from Judas. There's nothing different. St. Augustine wrote, Behold that most firm pillar of the church, touched by, but by one breath of danger, trembles all over. Where is now that boldness of promising, that confident vaunting of himself? The passage in Mark tells us that Peter followed at a distance. I remember being in an adult Sunday school waiting to preach at a, at a little church. And I remember that the Sunday school teacher kind of, kind of chewing on Peter a little bit about the fact that he had followed at a distance. We have a tendency to do that. You know, we have all these centuries separating us. We have all this hindsight, and we don't think we'd be like Peter. And so the Sunday school teacher is going on and about what a, what a jerk Peter was for following at a distance. And an older man in the congregation, when it came time to talk, older man in the congregation pointed out that he thought credit should be given where credit was due. Peter at least followed, right? What had happened? The, right? the other ten, one had gone away to never come back. The other nine had gone into hiding. Peter was at least following at a distance. Credit where credit is due. Peter loved the Lord. He was a man of some natural courage. He was the only one who took up arms in the Lord's behalf and against impossible odds that Greek word in our passage for that detachment that came to arrest Jesus, that word indicates that there was two to 300 people that showed up at the garden that night with their torches and swords to arrest him. You might have pictured a small, a small group coming out, but no, it's two to 300 people that came out to arrest Jesus. It was Peter who confessed to the Lord, you are the Christ, the son of the living God when many others were deserting the Lord. He asked the twelve if they would leave him too, and it was Peter who said, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. It was Peter whose passion for Jesus was so great that he pledged his undying loyalty to the Lord earlier that same night in the upper room, like we heard. But here in this moment, Peter behaved like an out-and-out coward, undone by the simple question of a young servant girl. Put on a spot, he becomes pitiful, odious, despicable in our view, contemptible for his cowardice at this moment when his Lord and Savior was undergoing a supreme test. Now, our failures may not be as dramatic. Our failures may not be as well-known as Peter's. But you're thinking, people, you can see where this is going. Whether by our words or our actions, we've all denied Christ our Savior and Lord. And if Peter, the leader of the apostles, according to at least Matthew and some of the other parallel verses, if the leader of the apostles, who obviously was a committed, loyal follower of Jesus, failed by denying Christ three times, we're not immune. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Pastor Sean shared some commentary, shared a commentary with me on our passage. The writer noted that it's like watching cracks in the house's foundation slowly spreading. A servant girl comes up to Peter and says, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm not. Verse 17, first crack. Peter then stands by a fire to keep warm. Some bystanders say to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Verse 25, Second crack. One of Malchus' relatives sees Peter and asks, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed, verses 26 and 27. The final crack. The foundation collapses. And just like the floodwaters of the James River, in rushes that overwhelming destructive power of guilt. You know how it feels. The writer wrote, for us, the collapse happens when we say, just one more drink. Just one more lie. Just one more fling. Just one more look. Crack, crack, crack. The late Pastor Al Strand used to say that there was non-practicing alcoholics. I can tell you as a non-practicing alcoholic that one more leads to one more. Leads to one more. And when there's enough cracks, there will always be a collapse. You know how it feels to cut to the heart as fear and panic race through your body. That's what Peter felt when the rooster crowed. Luke adds in his gospel that after the rooster crowed, Luke 22, verse 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. John says the servant girl looked at Peter. The word that John used indicates they made eye contact. As he came through the gate, she looked at Peter she looked right at him and asked him if he was a disciple. Luke used the same word. The cock crowed, and the Lord turned and looked into Peter's eyes. Peter was caught, and he withered in the heat of self-condemnation. Guilt eats us up. It beats us down. It turns our anger upon ourselves. It stretches us beyond our limits. It fills us with shame. So what is left for someone who is destitute and destroyed and demoralized and defeated? What is left? Grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. We sang it. At the very moment Peter was denying Jesus, Jesus was suffering and preparing to die for Peter's sin. Do you think Peter saw condemnation in the eyes of Jesus? 
the one who would come out and look at a gathering like this and look at us and think to himself, they look like sheep that have lost their shepherd. I think Peter saw compassion. I think when he looked, even in that moment, I think he saw compassion. For even as he was preparing to die, Jesus was preparing to restore the one who had been lost. So here we are in the middle of the mess. And what does God bring before us? A mirror. Second point, the mirror. I have some stones with me this morning. For anyone that wants to come up and throw them at Peter. Of course, I'm speaking metaphorically. But throwing stones comes easily to most of us. But the one who has loved the Lord our God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself, be the first to cast a stone. Let the one for whom every single choice and decision you've been made has been guided by an unwavering 24-hour devotion to God, let that be the person to come up and take a stone. Somebody has written that we spend so much time looking down on others, we get to look up at the greatest of all. We spend so much time looking down on others, we fail to look up to the one who is greatest of all. We see our need for a Savior in the compassion of the Son of God. A little later in that chapter, John 18, a little farther down the page, verse 32, this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Compassion of the Son of God. A, a commentator from decades, maybe a couple centuries ago. The innocent is punished so the guilty might be forgiven. War is declared on the beloved Son so that God's enemies might have peace. The great physician is wounded so that the mortally sick might be healed. He who knew no sin is made sin so that we who know only sin might be made righteous. Eternal life is sentenced to die so that the spiritually dead might have life. The one to whom belongs the treasures of heaven is made poor so that we might become rich. He's shamed that we might be honored. He's rejected that we might be accepted. He is cursed that we might be blessed. How many times have we found ourselves acting in ways that betray everything that we say we believe? Ways that are nothing short of contemptible for people who know what we know who have been blessed with the mercy that we've been blessed with. How many times have we failed in ways that cause us to blush just to think about it? And not just once, not just twice, but again and again and again. This wasn't the last time for Peter. This was not the last time for Peter. You can read for it yourself this afternoon after you've done shoveling out. Once in Antioch, years later, Paul had to rebuke the apostle to his face when his cowardice once again took over. You can read for it. Galatians chapter 2. You can look it up and check to see if it's there. But being crippled and failing does not mean that God has given up on you because God never gives up on you. We tell ourselves that we're too far gone. God says, I never give up on you. John 21, the account of Jesus asking Peter if Peter loves him. And Jesus asks the question three times. One for each time that P Peter denied him. And Peter confesses each time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter threw himself on the mercy of of Christ and was restored. Judas tried to fix things his way and he died in his rejection and his loss. Now here's where this can get off the rail because so often this account is turned into some kind of lesson on personal ethics and integrity. It's easy and it's common and I've heard this. I've heard this in Sunday schools. I've heard this from pulpits. 
it's easy and it's common to teach that Peter failed, but because he got his head on straight and did the right thing, he was restored and given the power to move forward. It's easy to miss the main thing, which is the plain thing. Someone once observed, it isn't the mountain ahead that wears you out. It's the grain of sand in your shoe. The overarching story here is not which grains of sand most troubled Peter. It's the fact that even the faithful disciple needs a savior. None is good, not one. All the advantages and opportunities given him, all the courageous acts and professions of faith given by him, and he is still a sinner in need of a savior. And you're sitting there going, I've heard this so many times to ad nauseum, and yes. Because I'm not here to tell you something you haven't heard. I'm here to remind you of the things you must never forget. I love to tell the story to those who know it best, being hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. When you trip up this week, and you will trip up, and when you lose your focus, and you will lose your focus, God does not give up on you. And you'll need to remember someone hung on a cross. And that's the only way you're going to be able to come back from where you find yourself. There's a mess. We look into the mirror. Now we know we need the mender. The mender. Nothing in this world escapes the control of God Almighty, even those sins for which we are entirely responsible and which cover us with shame. The Bible is adamant in insisting on that point so that we never indulge in a foolish illusion that, it, at least in some things, God is not on his throne. God is always on his throne. Despicable as Peter's behavior was, unconscionable as was his lie, his disowning of the Lord who had loved him and at that very moment was giving his life for him, as shameful and inexcusable and selfish and craven and soft as Peter was in that courtyard, he did precisely what the Lord said he would do. The Lord Jesus knew what was going on, knew what would happen and why. He knew it and he was in control of it. History unfolded. Even in the matters of the betrayals of Judas and Peter, history unfolded precisely as God had appointed and the Lord had predicted. The love of Christ to sinners is a love that surpasses all understanding. To suffer for those we love is suffering that we understand. To submit to abuse when we have no power to resist can be wise. But to suffer voluntarily when the power to resist and to suffer for those to seek to deny or end your existence, to die for those who are the abhorrent opposite of all that you know and love, that is love that is beyond our understanding. And yet that is precisely what Christ did. When did God start loving you? When did God start loving you? When you started attending church? When you started showing interest in religion? When you started reading your Bible? When you decided you were going to be a better person? When you decided maybe those things they were talking about in confirmation might be worth thinking about? When did God start loving you? Somewhere along the line, did he say, oh, I can love you now? No. God loved you before the dawn of time. He loved you in Christ before creation, before he created the universe. God loved you. That's what we mean when we speak of God's grace. Romans 5, verse 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. 
I don't know if you've ever been present when a person died. Some of us have been in the presence of death more times than we want to talk about. And yet Christ chose to die for us when we were everything abhorrent and opposite of him. He was led away captive, brought to the high priest, because he had set his whole heart on saving sinners. By bearing our sins, by being treated as a sinner, by being punished in our place, he was a willing prisoner to set us free. He was convicted and condemned to buy our forgiveness and restore our innocence and relieve us of our guilt. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He suffered and he died because he came in order to become our substitute and purchase our salvation. And now he has become our merciful high priest who's wounded with our hurts. Peter felt the shame, but he was raised again after heartfelt repentance and bitter tears. He was not left to deal with the consequences of his sin. That same sympathetic hand that reached down and pulled him out of the ocean, out of the sea, is the same hand that reached down and raised him up when he fell in the high priest's courtyard. And if Peter's fall makes us see our own weaknesses, and Christ's great compassion, then let's embrace the truth of God's word and throw ourselves upon the grace and the mercy of our loving God. I have this, and then we'll be done. Invite the team to come up. Charles Bowles adopted the name Black Bart. And he proceeded to rob Wells Fargo stagecoaches in Northern California and Southern Oregon between 1875 and 1883. Before he's done, he robbed at least 28 stagecoaches. But when the authorities tracked him down, they didn't find a bloodthirsty bandit. They found a mild-mannered businessman living in a small house in Decatur, Illinois. This man pictured by the newspapers as storming through the Wild West with his guns blazing, was so afraid of riding horse, he went around on a horse-drawn buggy, or he walked to and from the scenes of his crimes. He never shot anyone because he never put a bullet in his gun. He never put a shell in his shotgun because he was too afraid it might go off. Someone has said that guilt is a defeated enemy that has no bullets in its gun. Jesus has disarmed the guilt and the sin. Fled, died, he rose again so that you can turn it over to him. The guilt The sin has no bullet in its gun. Give it to him. Give it to him and live in your freedom. Our story does not end as long as Jesus has a part of it. There's a way back from your pain and your sorrow and your guilt, a way back from all of that by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit who gives you faith in Christ alone. Confess your sins and failures to God. Ask him to forgive you and to guide you. The team sang it. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. C.L. Bancroft put it this way in a hymn long ago. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on him. 
pardon me. God be with you. Amen. Thank you for coming out. God bless you. When the people of Israel were traveling through the wilderness, God directed Moses in how to bless the people. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May you go in peace and serve the Lord.